Secondly, I was just going to introduce our speaker for today. It is, uh, and I just learned how to pronounce this, Luca Dele Monache. <laughs> uh, so Luca is a scientist with NCAR here, um, and he is currently the Science Deputy Director of the National Security Applications Program, or NSAP, uh, of the Research Applications Laboratory, RAL. He helps manage a group of 15 scientists and 10 software engineers. He defines broad scientific and pro programmatic strategies for NSAP, and he manages large multi-institutional projects supported by DOD, NOAA, NASA, and DOE. Luca earned his Laureate degree, which is uh, equivalent to a master's degree in mathematics from, from the University of Rome in Italy in 1997, a master's degree in meteorology from San Jose State University, and then a PhD in the University of, or excuse me, a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver. And uh, immediately preceding working at NCAR, he was at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So from for after that, I'll just let Luca take over. So thank you. Thank you. I want to thank John for the nice introduction and also Gabby for uh, inviting me to, to give this talk as part of the ACOM seminar series. And I'm going to talk about a project that has been funded by NASA uh, about chemical data simulation and analog based uncertainty quantification uh, for a quality prediction uh, over the US. First, I will ac acknowledge the team that is, is contributing to this ongoing project. Uh, Gab is the QPI, and we have uh, collaborators based not only from RAL here, but also from NCUBE and from ACOM as well as from two universities, the University of Maryland and the CU Boulder, as well as a couple of labs and NOAA, the NOAA ARL lab and the ESRL lab. So here's the outline of my talk. I'll describe the project uh, goals and objectives. And this is the list of the tasks. Uh, one task, and in parentheses here, you see the lead for each task. Uh, there is a task on chemical data simulation, one on uncertainty quantification, one on a spreading technique to generate two-dimensional maps led by colleagues at NOAA, and then there is an important task to transition the develop uh, algorithms uh, to operation for NOAA and NSEP. And also there is a new task that started last year on uh, socioeconomic impact study, uh, which is led by Jeff Lazo. And I will conclude with, with a summary. Now, uh, for the time that I have today, I'm going to focus on those two tasks, the chemical data simulation task and the uncertainty quantification task. So but let's start with the goal and the objectives of this project. So now I NSEP produce a quality forecast that over throughout the country, which are a key tool for decision maker across uh, the U.S., the different air quality district, to trying to protect the public uh, from poor air quality. And, and so our the main goal of this project is try to improve the accuracy of these predictions for, for both ozone and PM 2.5, as well as to provide the decision maker with reliable uncertainty quantification. And we have two main objectives to, to accomplish that. The first one is to improve the initialization of the CMAC model, which is the EPA Community Multiscale Quality Model, which is the model used by ANSEP, uh, through chemical data simulation uh, of uh, satellite uh, retrievals uh, with the Community Grip Point Statistical Interpolation, the GSI system. And, and then, oh, I see I got two ones. There should be a two. <laughs> improve, I guess they are equally important. <laughs> and the second objective is to improve uh, the CMAC accuracy with, and also to provide an uncertainty quantification with analog based uh, methodology. So the main tool of, that we use for this project are the CMAC model and, uh, and GSI, so I want to describe those briefly. Um, so what NOAA um, puts together for the nation is the so-called national quality forecast uh, capability. Um, which is based on the CMAC model. And here you see some of the specifics of the, of the model that we are using, uh, which is trying to mirror what NOAA is using uh, in, uh, for uh, real-time operations. It's, uh, the version is 5.1, it's 12 kilometer horizontal grid increments across the US, and those are the missions that we are using. The, right now, the initial condition comes from the previous CMAC run, and the binary conditions are static. Um, 
I think they use seasonal averages for the boundary conditions. And w there are many other configurations that we try to mimic to replicate the system that we're running operationally. And that all the tests that I'm going to show you to today are for the period from 15 July to 14 of August 2014, which overlap with the Frappe uh, field campaign that we was held over the front range, uh, which is a data set we hope to, to use to, to verify the model further. So let's start uh, with the uh, chemical data simulation task, which is being led by Rajesh. And for this task, we're using uh, the GSI system. Um, here you see the standard uh, formulation of a variational um, algorithm. So the goal here is to uh, minimize this cons function. And I want you to uh, focus on uh, two important parameters, which we've done quite a bit of work and testing to uh, develop it specifically for a quality application, which is the H forward operator, which is needed to calculate AOD from, from CMAC uh, chemical composition, and also the, the B matrix, the background error covariance matrix, which is very important because it's, it's basically, it's an object that tells the algorithm how to spread the correction in space and across different variables once an observation is available. Here is a flow chart of the GSI system and uh, some of the main modifications we've done to it. The inputs are in gray. Uh, you see the input from the, uh, comes from the CMAC output model, uh, the first guess, then the MODIS, aerosol optical, aerosol optical depth, and the background error covariance method, which is computed with the GMB software, which I will describe in a couple of slides. And so in green here, you see all the modifications that we had to do to the GSI system to, to implement this chemical data simulation step. And the main one include basically uh, formatting the CMAC data uh, into the GSI intermediate files. And the most uh, critical one has been the, uh, the one in the biggest box, which, which is the implementation of a new forward operator uh, to perform the AOD um, aerosol optical depth uh, assimilation. Uh, once that forward operator is in place, it goes into the minimization routine that generate the, um, the increments analysis for the new initialization field that can use for the next forecast. For the forward operator, this is the formula that we implemented. It's based on an expression proposed by Malm and Ann in 2007. And as you see, uh, you use different, as input different variables that come out of the CMAC prediction. And also uh, one important characteristic is, is that uh, the esthetician coefficient here is, depends on the uh, parametric formulation of relative humidity. And the parametric formulation is indicated there to the right on the graph, show how different species, that's uh, the profile that is adopted uh, in this formulation. Um, it's, it's a, the advantage of this implementation is a very simple uh, formula, which, which means it can, it's very easy to compute the adjoint with available mathematical tools online. That's what we've done, which the adjoint is a component that is needed uh, for the uh, calculation of the cons function in the GSI system. And also, we liked it because this calculation is consistent with the visibility calculation that is currently available in CMAC. Now, let me describe you briefly uh, how uh, we generate uh, the background error covariance matrix, which, as I said earlier, is the, uh, the key component of any data simulation system. So in GS for GSI, we use the GMB software, which basically used two different uh, two different uh, simulations over a, a provided period uh, to calculate uh, the error covariance matrix. In this case, we use two different forecasts initialized at different time, at 0z and 6z. And, and then the values of these forecasts at, at valid time where the observation are available, which for this study are the 15, 18, and 21z, are used to do the calculation in a GMB matrix. And so basically, these results having forecasts that are initialized at different times or so different meteorology. But also, um, as is well known to the expert here uh, in air quality modeling, the main uncertainties for meteorology comes from, uh, sorry, for air quality prediction come from meteorologies, but also in the emissions. So we decided also to test uh, a very simple perturbation uh, for the emission to try to capture also the uncertainty that comes from the emission for air quality. And the way we did that, this is a clever, um, a clever approach um, thought out by Rajesh, where we basically, what we did, we, we have our baseline emission inventory, which is the NEI on the left. And then we look at four other different 
uh, emission inventories that are available to us, which is the Edgar, the Eclipse, the Pegasus, and the Max City. And what we do at every grid point, we compute the average deviation of those emission inventories from the NEI, which we use as the, uh, as the control, basically, emission inventory. And we add this perturbation to the run that is initialized at 6 as 6Z. So basically, we have two predictions, two foregas that are used to compute the uh, background error covariance matrix that differs in meteorology and in emissions. So let me show you the impact of uh, doing this. First of all, as a sanity check, early on in the project, we did a test of how, um, how the fitting of the AOD data um, what was the quality of the AOD fitting perf performed with this uh, data series of system that we put together? So in the upper left here, you see the MODIS, uh, the observation of MODIS, basically. On the upper right, you see the first guess of the model, what, what the model think, the CMAG model think that the AOD should look like. And then the bottom two panels represent two different iterations on, on the, of the CMAG model. Uh, basically indicating that we can, with this uh, machining that we put together, we can fit very well the observation of uh, AOD. So this was a very early on uh, promising uh, result showing that uh, uh, the implementation of the forward operator is working as it's supposed to do. But then going back to the GE matrix, um, here you see uh, what happened if we use, so you're seeing an example of a few days in one specific location to the north, in the northwest US. In black you see the observation, in red you see the CMAC estimate without any data simulation. And in blue, you see the CMAC estimate with data simulation when the background error, error covariance matrix used is the one where there is only the perturbation of the meteorology. And you see that there is a correction in the right direction, but it's, it's still pretty far from, uh, from the observations. When we add to the uh, BE calculation the perturbation of emissions, that's what you see with the green light. That, it basically, you get much closer to what is the observed value. And here, uh, I want you to notice when I look at observation of PM 2.5, because this, this is the main goal of the project. We want to improve the prediction of PM 2.5, which is challenging, because that's a, ground, a, surface, a surface quantity, whereas we are simulating AOD, which is a column quantity. But nevertheless, by doing the perturbation also the emission, we get much closer to what the observed value is, even though uh, obviously it's not perfect, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, to have an overall view how this is performing, uh, here you see all the stations that we have available over this month for the AirNow network, which is managed by EPA. Those are stations of uh, data that provides PN 2.5 measurements. And we are, as I say, we're doing a simulation 15, 18, and 21Z. And in black, you see the observation. In red, CMAC before that assimilation. And in blue, CMAC after the assimilation. And the performance is different depending on the, the time we do the assimilation, which reflect also uh, the way at different times the MODIS data is distributed over the US. Uh, but definitely what we're doing is, is, is in the right, it's a step in the right direction. We are pushing the model towards what is the observed status. Um, same situation, looking at some of the performance metric. Upper left, you have the co correlation coefficient, uh, bias, and center root to mean square error. Center root to mean square error is basically um, the component of the root to mean square error uh, that has conditional biases in it and also random errors. So what you see here, all the three times that we do a simulation of the MODIS data, which those are the times when the data is available over the US, uh, we are uh, improving correlation. We are uh, reducing uh, the, the bias at times drastically. Um, and so again, the, the data simulation is do what it's supposed to do. At 15Z in particular, we think that the higher, the very high center root to mean square is due by the misrepresentation of the model of sea salts, specifically in the, uh, on the West Coast um, stations. But overall, again, the, the system is performing well, even though if you look at the correlation, still, even after that assimilation, the correlation is pretty low. It's, it's about 0.2 or, or slightly above it. Here's another example of the performance in um, a couple of stations where the model is uh, clearly underpredicting the, the observed signal. Uh, but after the data simulation, um, the, uh, in, the, in blue, uh, as indicated by the time series in blue, it gets much closer uh, to the observed values. 
Uh, here on the top, another two stations, for example, the top one in Florida, you see that is the, uh, there is the opposite situation, what I showed you the previous slide, where the model is actually overestimating the observation. And again, uh, our data simulation system does a good job of pushing the, meta, the model back towards the observation where it's supposed to be. So again, in general, the data simulation system is working. But then obviously the question for uh, any data simulation system is what happened with the forecast that is initialized with those improved uh, initial conditions. That's what we've been looking at. And here now I'm getting into territory of very preliminary results. And in fact, one reason to, for, for you guys, to show you guys this, uh, these results is also to have a, a feedback how we could uh, move forward with this analysis. We have made our, a couple of good hypothesis, I think, but definitely we, uh, we can benefit from feedbacks from experts here. So what you see here, uh, we group the different stations in different, uh, uh, different regions. And what you're seeing for every group on the right, there is a time series of the 24 hours of either the observation, the, the CMAP background, and the CMAP data simulation. The vertical dashed line indicates the time when we do the assimilation. So basically, for example, if you look at group one, during the assimilation, we do a good job at pushing the model toward the observation, which is what you saw from the previous results. However, the following 24 hours, actually, the, the run with the data simulation blow up. It, it goes uh, farther away from the observation with respect to the run that doesn't have the data simulation. And there are other situations, for example, other regions in group three where uh, the model even do, so the, the part between zero and 15 UTC, that is, you can look at that as uh, nighttime, uh, late afternoon. For group three, things looks better in the sense that over that time, the model is actually, the data simulation run is closer to the observations. Um, and so we're trying to understand what is going on here. Why, why is happening that even though we're improving the initial condition, for example, group one, uh, things actually are getting much worse a few hours after the forecast. So to do that, to, to dig into that problem, uh, we used a very, actually a very neat tool that is available with the CMAC model, which allows to do a process analysis. It basically allows you to understand uh, what are the different components in the model that are contributing to the PN 2.5 concentration. So here you see the example for group one, and uh, on, on the top left are the stationary use for this group, on, on the right the same plot as before. Then here on the, on the middle left panel, you see uh, the, um, that's the contribution for the accumulation mode. And on the right is the course mode of, uh, the, uh, of the aerosols. And so basically, you see that for the course mode, with and without that assimilation, the runs have the same estimate of that specific mode. Whereas the problem is here. Basically, after that assimilation, the model is, is as a much higher uh, accumulation mode, which resulted likely in this peak over here. And now, these other two panels here show you two other um, processes in the model that contribute to PN 2.5 concentration. One is the vertical diffusivity, and another is the dry deposition. Now, the vertical diffusivity also includes the gravitational settings, which leads to the settling of the aerosols, the heaviest particle, to the ground. And so what you see here, something that we uh, we think might be a problem in CMAC is that overnight there is basically not dry deposition. Dry deposition is zero, which uh, we found to be strange. Um, and the, the increase um, in concentration come from the fact for the higher vector, um, vertical, it might come, that's an hypothesis actually, we're still trying to understand this problem. But it might come from the higher vertical diffusivity. Notice that here the scale goes back to minus, down to minus 50. So actually this is a significant difference between these two lines. And, and so we think that the problem is what, uh, what I put down in the insert there is that the, the nighttime increase in accumulation mode concentration is re related to the fact that the vertical diffusion is not balanced by the dry deposition at the surface. And if you look at other groups of stations, we, we do see uh, similar results. Um, where basically, uh, and here the difference is that there is the, the, the um, the degrees, so the degrees in aerosol mode concentration is associated with the adjustment in the assimilation that is due by the assimilation of the AOD. Um, 
But again, also here, we, we believe that the, the, the increase in accumulation mode overnight is due by the fact that there's no dry deposition the, to counterbalance uh, the vertical diffusivity. And this is, as I said, we are actually uh, looking at this problem right now and trying to, to diagnose what, what would be the problem. But I think what, one, one of the take home message here is that you can use that assimilation um, not only to improve our forecast, but it's also it's, it's an interesting tool to diagnose problems in the model. So what we're seeing here is that the data simulation is uncovering an issue uh, with the model formulation, um, which might be necessary, the model formulation might be necessary to improve to actually have an overall improvement uh, for the system. Here's another uh, piece of evidence um, that uh, there might be something of not quite right in CMAC. Here you're looking at the uh, deposition velocity on the left overnight, on the right over the day. And there is a large area here uh, where actually we have a lot of stations for the metrics that I showed you earlier where the dry deposition is actually zero. And again, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't think that's uh, probably physically correct. So we're looking into that to see um, if that is, that is the reason why uh, we are having overestimation overnight, even though with that assimilation we are improving the initial condition. As I said, this is a very much an ongo ongoing task. Uh, we still have se several months on this project, so we welcome, sincerely welcome any uh, feedback uh, for any of you who might have an idea of what is going on here. Now, let me talk a little bit about the second task, which is led by Stefano on the annual ensemble. And we use the annual ensemble uh, for uh, the uncertainty quantification part. And many of you have seen me talking about it. And so uh, my apology for those of you who already see those slides, but all we think there is someone that is not familiar with the topic. So I just want to briefly uh, touch upon the most important aspect of it. So the basic idea is that um, if I look at the forecast today, if I found forecasts from the past that look very similar to the current prediction, those forecasts in the past are going to make a similar error of what the current forecast is going to do. The forecasts from the past, though, I have observations for it, so I know what kind of errors they made, so I can make inference from that information on what the error for today's prediction is going to be. That is the basic idea. And people have been trying the analog concept for, for decades in our, in our field. For example, here I show you the uh, work from, uh, from Ed Lawrence in 1969, where he was trying to find analogs over the northern hemisphere. He was trying to match a lot of grid points, trying to find, to find good matches in his historical data set. And he reported some of the conclusion that are listed in his paper, which are that there are numerous mediocre analogs, but not truly good ones and also that the likelihood of encountering any truly good analog by processing all existing upper level data appears to be small. Actually, Van den Duhl in 1994 took the pain to estimate how long of a training data set we might need to have good matching analogs if you're doing a matching over the northern hemisphere. And his estimate is actually that you will need a library of 10 to the 30 years to find good matching analogs. And he said, obviously, with 10, 100 years of data, the probability of finding good analogs, it's very small. But then he left a little bit of opening in the door here. He said, unless one is satisfied with analogy over small areas or in just two or three degree of freedom. And that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing with our implementation. So let me show you how we implement this analog concept. So let's assume that we are a specific location. For example, it could be a grid point or it could be an observation location. Uh, we have a prediction from a deterministic model, for example, the CMAC model of PN2.5. And as I say, what, what we want to find, we assume that we have an historical data set of prediction from the same model. We want to find from that data set predictions that look very similar to the current forecast at that, at that forecast lead time. And we do that using a, a multivariate matching matrix across different annual predictors, which is defined in this paper down there. And based on the metric, we select the best matching forecast from the past. Let's say that we want to do a three-member analogs. We select the three best matching analogs. In this, case, in this cartoon here, those three uh, black squares. Once we found those analog forecasts, 
we select the observations that correspond to those foregas. In this case, if we want to make PM 2.5 predictions, we're going to use observation of PM 2.5. If you want to do ozone, th those are going to be ozone observation. Of course, depending on which variable you want to predict, the predictors that you want to use are different. But that said, those three observations here become our prediction in the future. So there are two very important aspects of uh, this, this way to make prediction. First of all, the prediction is actually based on observation from the past. This is very important because the, the, the real challenge historically to, to build an ensemble, it's always been to find samples from the right PDF. And this is exactly what we're doing here. We're using observation from the training to predict observation in the future. So we're actually sampling the right PDF. In other words, this is a, a perfect downscaling method because we're sampling the, the correct value from the correct PDF. Also, the other important aspect that to generate an ensemble in real time, we need to run the model only once. So either rather than doing the model multiple times, as traditionally has been done uh, to generate ensemble, so either you save a lot of computational resources, or if you want to use the same computational resources that I use uh, to generate traditional ensemble, then you can run your model because you need to run it only once, a much finer resolution with fancier numerics, for example, for a quality with more advanced and more expensive uh, chemical module, and so on and so on. We actually apply techniques to uh, to a range of applications, uh, we uh, for several uh, we we apply for se the prediction of several weather parameters: 10 and 80 meter wind speed, two meter temperature, relative humidity, uh, surface pressure, and so on. We extensively extensively used it, implemented for renewable energy application for the prediction of wind and solar power, and also for the prediction of energy uh, load. We apply for air quality prediction. That's what I'm going to talk about in next. Uh, we also apply for the prediction of tropical cyclone intensity. And, and more recently, we, a paper just get, get accepted on the generation of graded two-dimensional probabilistic prediction rather than prediction at single, uh, single point. And we also implemented this technique for downscaling uh, resource assessment for both wind speed and uh, precipitation. We have reported all of this work in, in the literature. I'll be happy to share with you these papers if you're interested. So let me talk now about the um, application of the annual ensemble for the prediction of uh, air quality. So this is the data that we use for the testing for, for NASA. Uh, those are the station for ozone. On the right, the station for PN 2.5. And we have 15 months of training for ozone, 13 uh, for PN 2.5. Here you see the data availability. And here also you see the different predictors that we used uh, to do the prediction of odds on OPN 2.5. Keep in mind that in our multivariate uh, matching uh, metric that we use to find analogs, we can assign weights to the different predictors. Uh, we have developed an automatic algorithm to, to determine the optimal weights for each of the predictors. And so that's what we've done also for, uh, for this test here. Here's an example of the probabilistic prediction that you can get out of the annual ensemble at two locations. Uh, for ozone, for example, here you're seeing the observation in black, the CMAC model that is used to generate the annual ensemble in red, and then you see the annual ensemble um, uh, distribution, the different quantiles as indicated there, um, and also the, the dash uh, yellow line represent the annual ensemble mean. And what you're seeing here that uh, the annual ensemble actually is accomplishing what we promised NASA it will accomplish, which is reducing the error of the model. For example, the overnight overestimation of the model is corrected by the annual ensemble. The annual ensemble mean gets much closer to the observed value. And also provide the uncertainty quantification, which, as I will show you in a couple of slides, actually uh, we can objectively uh, quantify that is re a reliable estimate of the uncertainties. Here you see an example uh, for PN 2.5. I think that's a good example to see how probabilistic prediction can be useful. So for example, if you look around here, our 40, both the, the CMAC model, and but also the annual ensemble mean, which you can think of it as a special case of a deterministic prediction, they're missing the observed peak. However, if for that event would you use a probabilistic prediction looking at the actual range of the ensemble members, you would have your ensemble you would have provide you with a probability of the of the concentration to to be above, for example, 15, 20 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Let's look at some objective verification uh, metric uh, for the annual ensemble. Here you have ozone on the left, PM on the right. 
first row is root mean square error, the bottom you have the bias. Um, the CMAP model in black, the annual ensemble meaning in red. And you see that the technique is working very well. Uh, we are drastically reducing the root mean square error for both ozone and PN 2.5, and we're also um, drastic, drastically reducing the bias in the prediction. Uh, because that's, that's what this technique is designed for. Uh, now, you might ask yourself, well, why you have some residual bias? The residual bias comes from the fact that, so the annual ensemble, by definition, will produce an um, unbiased estimate if your training is infinite. Of course, we will never get an infinite training data set. As I show you in this case, we have 13 and 15 months, respectively, for OZO and PN 2.5. So that bias comes from the fact that the training is not, um, uh, is not infinite. Um, actually, Stefano recently developed a bias correction technique that addressed that problem, which is more evident when the training is very short, which is, tends to be true for a quality prediction. It's very difficult to find it, uh, a good data set. And I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, with the, this new development of a bias correction to the annual ensemble, we actually can uh, uh, alle alleviate also the residual bi biases that are left in the prediction. But nevertheless, overall, across all the station, of course, this is an average metric, uh, the system is performing pretty well across uh, from Foraker's lead time from 0 to 48. Now, we also look at those similar metrics spatially. So here you're looking at the percentage increment with respect to the CMAC model. And, and so uh, on top correlation on the bottom root to mean square error. So one color means an improvement. And basically, for us, we are improving everywhere. That's what we are seeing here. And so that this was very good news. And often, you know, improvements are above 35, 40% with respect to the CMAP model. So very large improvements uh, with respect to the, uh, to the raw model for guess. Similar results uh, for PM2.5, even though PM2.5, the results are not as good as for ozone. And here you see for root mean square error, definitely improvements everywhere. There are just a couple of places where the, uh, the improvement is negative, me meaning that we're uh, making things worse. Correlation, we tend to preserve it. Sometimes we make it worse. But overall, uh, we are improving both ozone and PN2.5 prediction. Uh, because this result, actually, NOAA is currently running operationally both these techniques for ozone and PN2.5. And PN2.5 is, is now one year and a half that they're running it. Ozone, they just start implementing. Now, I've been now, they want to do things their way, so they're doing the annual with only, they started with only one month for training, which I wasn't really happy about it. And I said, you can't really do an annual method with one month for training. But things are getting better. They're accumulating data. Now they have one year of data. Things are starting to look much better, and they are starting to see these kind of results. Now, uh, as I say, with the annual ensemble, so the, the, sim the simple things you can do is look at the annual ensemble mean, and that's what I show you with these deterministic metrics. But the, the greatest added value is that actually now we have an ensemble. So we can look how good this ensemble is. Uh, this is a rank histogram from an example for PN2.5. Basically, um, for those of you that are not familiar with this, this diagram, it allows you to assess the statistical consistency of the ensemble. So. Uh, in a perfect ensemble, the true, the observation, cannot be distinguished by the ensemble members. Therefore, if you rank the observation against the ensemble member over the verification period, and you collect the frequency at every rank, you should have a flat shape. And you see here that we're very, very close to a flat shape. And I know you guys, how many times you uh, look at a rank history, but if you look at traditional ensemble method, they always they are very U-shaped because they don't have enough spread. So this is showing us that this ensemble is naturally calibrated for the reason that I explained you uh, above. Now, this is the last slide I have. And this is perhaps the most important aspect of an ensemble. We do ensemble because we want to use ensemble to quantify uncertainties, right? What does it mean, quantify uncertainty? It means that. If my ensemble members are all agreeing with each other, they're all close to each other, there's not much spread, that should reflect a very accurate prediction, for example, of the ensemble mean. If the ensemble members are all over the places, that should reflect a very uncertainty prediction. So you want to use the spread as a proxy of uncertainty. The smaller the spread, the less the uncertainties. But that doesn't happen with every ensemble. So you can verify how true that is. Uh, by verifying this, the so-called spread ski relationship by compiling this diagram. Basically, what you do over your verification period, you bin the spread, 
And for every bin on the spread, you compute the root mean square of the ensemble mean. Actually, it can be shown mathematically that the root mean square of the ensemble mean in a perfect ensemble match the standard deviation of the ensemble members, which is the spread. So basically, on this diagram, you should be on the one-to-one -one line. And again, here you're seeing a very good ensemble. It's, very, it's, it's not perfect. It, there is a conditional bias. Uh, but it's very close to the one-to-one -one line. If you look at a, a raw dynamical ensemble, often you see horizontal lines, or you see a line over here. So this is out of the box. It's a very good product, product that the CCO makers across the nation can use to protect people's health. Here's a summary of my talk. Um, we are improving our ANSAP operational quality prediction with chemical data simulation and uh, we are now based method. Uh, I show you significant improved deterministic prediction for PN 2.5 ozone. I also show you that this technique can be used, the annual ensemble technique can be used to provide reliable uncertainty quantification. And again, we are running the SEMA model only once in real time. So this is a pretty big shift in paradigm in the way we are generating an ensemble prediction. And I also want to mention on the ongoing socioeconomic impact study that Jeff uh, is leading. And that study is designed to assess the value of the improved prediction to the decision making process. So we're looking forward to the outcome of the project as well. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Question. Be nice, Gabby. Oh, no, no, I'm going to grill you, Luca. Uh, no, I just have actually two questions. The one is, you have this problem in the dry, dry deposition for the aerosol species, right? So your ensemble method actually corrects for that also? Because it wasn't shown anymore in your comparisons there. It does, because it's, it's the way it's designed, specifically uh, systematic errors are easily captured by, by analog-based procedure. So it does. Yeah. I, I figured so. And then the other one, and I know I had suggested that once, have you looked at for air quality policies and health making, it's really important to capture the high ozone and high PM 2.5 episodes. Have you looked how your forecast specifically for you know, high pollution events No, we haven't, done, we haven't done that. And you're not the first one saying that. So I think we should be doing that. I think so. I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, and also people suggest us because you know the standards for PM 2.5 are eight hour average standards, right? Uh, PM 2.5 is actually 24 hours. 24 hours now? Okay. Uh, ozone is eight hours, right? Yeah. So, uh, and all the metrics I show you are for hour averages. So we need to we need to do also that too. But obviously, if you do hourly verification, that's a more stringent test than eight hours or 24 hour averages, right? So. We do think that we should see the same kind of improvements with eight hours and 34 hour averages. Right, but as I said, I think it would be really just focus on the high pollution events. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, I could imagine that your model, your analog based method might even uh, work better there. Yes, and for high pollution events, uh, I do think that the technique that Stefano has designed recently to, to account for the left tail of the distribution which Diano is going to suffer in predicting that, particularly when you have a short training. Uh, by implementing Stefano techniques, that should be very helpful for high concentrations. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Any more questions? I'm trying to understand the relative importance of the daytime error versus nighttime errors and how they perhaps influence each other. Because I imagine I'm dry counting, deposition. I'm counting on you. I'm sorry? I'm counting on you. Yeah, we need, uh, we need to untangle I imagine that. dry deposition is extremely uncertain in reality at night because you have very small scale stratification. And uh, so you really don't know how to calculate it accurately. Oh. But if you. If the model is making adjustments to match, to somehow account for that nighttime deposition, does that then create a residual memory that propagates into the day? Uh, or would you be better off, in other words, just doing all the daytime separately and all the night times separately? I think the problem is that we don't have, uh, we don't have any data at night. 
We can do a simulation all over the US with mod. It's all only during the day. We don't have any assimilation here. So I guess my question to you is, when you look at this, how this looks to you? The fact that we have large areas with zero dry deposition, does, does it look realistic to you, or it looks suspicious? Would you, would you expect zero dry deposition at night? No, but you would expect it from the layer that is closer to the ground than the model results. That's the problem. The model okay. resolution at night is totally insufficient near the surface, grossly insufficient. Yes, yes, yes. And the measurements could be highly biased due to the presence of one little tree over here or the rock over there, because you know, stratification over a few meters. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So neither the model nor the measurements are particularly good. I'm just wondering, is that then corrupting your daytime simulations? So what, one thing is that it's, if you can go to the process analysis slide. Um, so we see that we bring vertical diffusion brings more PM2.5 to the surface during the daytime. This one? The, yeah, this one. Um, the bottom floor on the left panel. But that is balanced by the dry deposition. So even if you add more or you less during nighttime to the model, the vertical mixing is so strong that, that uh, the deposition will, will remove its effect uh, from the, to, to propagate to the memory. So there is no memory, not much memory. Not much memory. memory. So you see that in the daytime that we assimilate, we have that the blue line is even more higher than the, the red line, which we bring more because of the vertical diffusion, but then because of the mixing, we also have strong dry deposition on the, on the right hand. I guess what? That's only during daytime. You don't yeah. know how balanced it is during nighttime. Yeah, we don't know. We and, no yeah, and during nighttime, we don't have any deposition. So that, that's, so that's the thing. So that's, that's the culprit here. So yeah. Does this yeah. make sense to you guys? I'm talking to chemists. No, zero. I mean, this is exactly zero. Actually, Rajesh looked different. This is exactly zero. I understand if it's not very high, but it's exactly zero. Looks. I don't understand in 5.1 that they added and they updated and restructured the dry deposition code in there. They did. They did. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if there is some bug somewhere. Is wrong. And I said we can look at our. 5.2 beta version. Actually, I was asking I was asking Rajesh if we can do a simulation with WorfCam for the same case. Just just see if what kind of value we get out of WorfCam. Right. But as I said, I think at first we can look at other CMAC runs and just see if our dry position rel value is really exactly zero, which doesn't really make sense. There's no reason why it should shut off in my time. Yeah. A very nice talk, Luca. Thank you. And just a curious and naive question. So for the CMAC forecast, that's like 12 kilometer degree spacing. How important the meteor meteorology field is actually playing to this whole picture? Because it looks like meteorology is not important at all. It seems like everything is like a local control. And very important. pretty much that way, or? No, 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 meteorology is very important. Yeah, I didn't see you discuss anything along that line? Um, yeah, because I guess that, that was not the That means the meteorology field is very well forecast during these events, or? Um, we haven't verified, actually, the meteorological fields. But it's not, I mean, generally speaking, the, the meteorology is very important, because that's what determines the spatial temporal patterns of the pollutants, right? The emissions determine the amounts, the magnitude of the pollutants. But the meteorology determines the spatial temporal distribution, right? So it's very important. And both, so basically for equality, the challenge is you need to get both right. Um, so here, I guess what, what these results are telling us, uh, given a level of fidelity of meteorology and a level of fidelity of the emissions, there actually seems to be a problem in one specific component of the air quality model, which is the, the dry deposition module of the model. All right, fair enough. I'll talk to you later. Yes.
So a couple questions ago, it was brought up that the CMAC model is, um, its vertical resolution is woefully inadequate at night to get at, to correctly assess or model the dry deposition. So I guess what is the, what is the lowest model layer height in the CMAC model? And secondly, how, how high would it need to be, or how low would it need to be in order to try to accurate, more accurately capture this process? Uh, Rajesh, do you, do you know by um, chance what so is the The lowest layer height is eight meters um, in the model, but the model says that if the, so the, the lowest boundary layer height is assumed by the model is 20 meters. So even if you are at eight meters and um, your boundary layer is say four or five meters, by the meteorological model, CMAX says, okay, set it to 20 meters. <laughs> yeah, but actually, there, there, like is, there, is, there is even uh, a more, you know, very practical constraint is that the group, and now I answer that is doing their quality prediction, they're very resources limited. So I'm sure you're going to tell them, hey, guys, you should use way more vertical levels. They're not going to do it just because they don't have the resources. So that's that's a very practical limitation. Thanks for all the questions. Are there any more? I have a question for the group. How many of you guys went somewhere to see the eclipse? Other than Boulder. Well, John, John, good things we postponed it, I think. What's that? Good thing we postponed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming.